So, are we okay? Yeah. Cool. Okay. How was yesterday? Good, but I have to say that you know by the end of it, I was I was pretty fried. Yeah. It's a little bit hard for me to put sentences together. <laughs> to to yeah, but I mean a lot of deciding and and great, and people were really supportive, and so I really enjoyed that. But it was a lot. Sure. Um, the show basically consists of um, there's an installation, uh, and the way that I'm uh, making the installation is by incorporating um, things that people are bringing to the show as part of a series of events. Um, and uh, as a whole, the show is a tribute to um, a couple of different moments in San Francisco queer history. Um, one in 1964 and uh, one in the um, early 90s. And it's really about these times when people were coming together in sort of clubs and spaces and, and coming up with new ways of interacting with each other and a, a new kind of um, I think a, a freedom that is uh, got its start in sort of sexual undergrounds, but was also about changing um, the social space. So um, one of those points is um, uh, the San Francisco's toolbox, which is one of the the first leather bars in in, uh, in San Francisco it used to be on Fourth and Harrison, um, and what's important about that is that it was uh, depicted in a 1964 issue of Life magazine, that was sort of the first um, uh, widespread examination of gay life in the U.S. And so there's a very famous picture of the interior of the toolbox um, that has a mural by an artist named Chuck Arnett. And uh, what was important is that that picture went everywhere. And so thousands of guys got to see, wait, there are these other people who are in these leather bars and it's in San Francisco, there's a place to go. So that's sort of the first big moment and I'm sort of recreating my own version of that photograph um, as part of the show. And then the other moment in 1991 is one that I was sort of here for uh, and, and is kind of looking at the, takes its inspiration from uh, uh, Club Uranus um, and uh, the sort of queer um, kind of punk art drag scene that was happening here around then. So it seems like you have a special 
relationship to San Francisco and kind of these, these time periods. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about kind of on the personal side why it's important or what, mm -hmm. what about it? Well, I think that what's one of the things that's been really unique about San Francisco is that it has been a place where people have been able to come to reinvent themselves. And I've, I've always been a person who has um, in, inhabited a lot of different roles but been very interested in the idea of integrating all of those roles. And so um, I'm a person who understands ideas and art theory and things like that when it's embodied, when it's made physical. So that's why I got involved in sculpture. And it's, I think, one of the things that's really important about um, queer sexuality and the leather scene and um, people who are exploring that, really what they're exploring is ways of performing and, and understanding themselves through doing something physical, um, either through taking on an identity or through engaging in an activity um, that changes their, their their physical experience. Um, one of the things for me is that is um, interesting about kind of this whole area and the stuff that I do, and uh, and what I found interesting too in some of the articles that I read or some of the interviews mm -hmm. with you was just talking about representations of mm -hmm. people and um, representations of queer people, of gay people, or whatever, mm -hmm. and kind of that whole area and how, mm -hmm. how, how complicated it is and on so many different levels. Um, so can you just talk about, um, when you think about representation um, or, I don't know, can you just talk about that dynamic or, and that complication? Sure, behavior? sure. Um, I think that these days I make a real distinction between representation and embodiment. And I think that there's, um, there's been, over the course of um, queer activism in, in the US, and there has been this sort of argument that's like, we need positive representations of gay people in the media. Um, and when people see positive representations of us, then they'll stop oppressing us. Um, and I kind of disagree with that, actually. I don't think, because I think what happens is that that gets turned back around on us, and, it, and the argument starts to be that um, we should then make sure that we are representing some sort of community in a positive way. And I'm not interested in people functioning as representations. I'm, I, it's like, I'm not interested in them representing. I'm interested in them being present, however they are. Um, and so I think that when we embody all of the different sorts of possibilities for how we can be in the world, um, then that's when we give each other sort of the courage to come out and be however we are. Um, and so the show is called, you know, Free Love Toolbox. And it's kind of about how we make these different kinds of spaces that allow us to be present for each other and find a kind of freedom in that presence. Um, and so you know, I'm someone whose appearance changes a lot. Um, I, you know, I've been sort of bigger, smaller, short hair, long hair, facial hair, no facial hair. You know, I've had identification as like, you know, a bear or as a daddy or as, you know, uh, as, you know, kind of a fop or a dandy and, and I, I like all of those identifications as long as 
we're free to play with them. Um, and to me, I think one of the things that's most powerful right now in queer culture is what's happening um, very much in the trans community around unlinking gender from sexuality and sexuality from appearance and gender from appearance and, and putting people back in the place of um, not making assumptions about each other, you know, um, and being willing to occupy all kinds of different territory. So um, I think that uh, hopefully the show provides a kind of launch pad for people to explore these different ideas of how they want to be present, how they want to embody different kinds of attitudes or, or ideas. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, I struggle with in my own, and I was in the porn industry for a while, mm -hmm. and um, at first it was super liberating. Mm -hmm. And then over time, as I was there longer and got higher up, it just it kind of shifted in the opposite direction where it became oppressive of body types and the, you know, the, the idea yeah. of masculinity and these, this kind of thing. So it's like this weird thing because like seeing those images for the first time for me as mm -hmm. a man was so important. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I ended up in that world right. and then felt kind of oppressed by it. So right. I'm just, I don't know how... Well, I think that there's... Um, I, I, I think that there's a difference between making porn and the porn industry. And, um, and it's always been sort of powerful and liberating when people um, make images of what they find pleasurable. You know, the porn industry, like any other um, industry, under capitalism is about generalization. It's about coming up with something that enough people find uh, pleasurable or that enough people desire that you can sell a lot of it. Um, and one of the things, we, we were talking about the, the, the porn industry in, or, or pornography in the 70s as opposed to now and in, um, and there was a similar thing about the art world and, and the performance world at that time. Um, there was no real money to be made and people were really localized and there wasn't really national distribution and you couldn't be everywhere at once. So there were like these little pockets of people making things that they were interested in um, and that they were excited by. And it was much more of a, there was much more passage back and forth between people in the avant-garde theater world and people in the, in, in the porn world and people in the art world um, because it was small scale. And, uh, you know, as that became more of a money-making proposition, and as the distribution got um, uh, more standardized, that's when you had this sort of like, okay, this is the body type that sells the most, so we need more of that. This is the type of activity that sells the most, so we need more of that. I think what we've seen recently is, you know, things like Xtube or, the, you know, these, these sites that are that start out as being people uploading their own stuff, um, and it's very similar to the zine explosion of the late '80s and early '90s, where people were making their own publications. And you know, like Bear Magazine really started out as a, basically a, a zine you know, um, that a bunch of guys were, were documenting the stuff that they were doing south of market. Um, and it was really interesting to watch how that really varied 
group of guys, like lots of different looking guys in the early issues of that magazine, how that got really standardized into a type. Um, how does, how about that same dynamic in the art world? You kind of started to touch on that, but could you sure. talk to I think that, that you know, I think that uh, one of the things that happened in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s is that we had the rise of the international art event and the art fair and this way that suddenly, um, you know, museums and collectors and, and, um, and, and uh, you know, curators and artists got, became this sort of weird jet set where everybody was traveling everywhere and all of the work started to look sort of the same even though there's a kind of there's a sort of lip service to regionalism or a lip service to multiculturalism the way in which those issues are being dealt with are supposed to be kind of standardized um, so that they're kind of intelligible to people from whatever country they're in and museums got very into this idea of building like a world-class collection. So you might have a couple of German artists, you might have a couple of Japanese artists, you might have a couple of Chinese artists, you might have, you know, people from New York and LA and some from San Francisco or whatever. But what they all had in common was a sort of similar language of material handling and, and, and presentation that made sure that they were not um, disruptively unique, um, so that nothing would look like too corny, right? Um, and I think the, the problem there has been that, you know, international art surveys start to look the same. Um, uh, you know, there's a kind of expected career um, that is very sort of legible, but uh, to me kind of uninteresting, kind of divorced from, from uh, you know, anything outside of itself. Um, so for me, what's happened over the past, you know, 10, 15 years is that I've gotten increasingly interested in in some ways, the unquantifiable things about um, art experiences. And, and one of the things that I think is really powerful in the kink world is that, you know, uh, that's really a place where it's like two people are putting on a performance for each other. So the audience for the performance and the performers are the same. And anybody who participates is also putting themselves on the line, you know? And that goes back to this, this the thing that really struck me about um, the toolbox and about this early scene. In order for you to participate in that world, you had to be present, you had to be visible in it. You couldn't lurk online and come up with a persona and not have people know you. You had to go to one of those spaces. And that to me is a kind of powerful thing. And I kind of want to bring the work, the art work back to that. So that if you're going to eat at this place, you have to, bring some kind of food to it. You have to bring some part of yourself to it. Um, uh, that's why the, the events for, the, for, this, um, for this show are all sort of falling under the headline of show and tell. You know, bring something and talk about it and we'll share the experience together. And I feel like that's a much more powerful model than this kind of audience model that, that the art world has right now, which is that, you know, people wander from space to space to space. Their presence there is never implicated. And 
they just sort of take, you know, take stuff in. Um, the artist touches something for a certain amount of time and then places it somewhere and goes away and then that thing is not supposed to change, is not supposed to shift and everybody is you know, supposed to have this kind of triangulated relationship to it. I don't think that works in sex and I, I, don't, I also don't think that it works in art. I really like the idea of a sort of continued intimacy that I think about a lot is it seems like history is an important part of what mm -hmm. you do. It's like how, especially in gay culture, queer culture, whatever the hell you identify it as, this kind of um, romanticizing of the past of like, you know, before AIDS and before Tom, mm -hmm. the early, you know, the early, the, kind of the period that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, the history is obviously part of what you're doing. How does it, I mean, in some ways, you just answered this because you talked about wanting people to experience it as opposed to mm -hmm. passively watch it. But just talk about the way that history is important in what you do and how you're not trying to fetishize history, or mm -hmm. you are, but mm -hmm. you know, just kind of that area of. Mm -hmm. that's, Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's the model of culture, and I guess that the, the model that I tend to use is sort of best understood in jazz, right? Where you're playing with other people, um, you understand that the tune may come from some place, you may not have written it, but you receive it, you play it, you do something with it, and you pass it off to the next person. And I really think that's what culture is, you know, that, so that history and culture is not meant to remain intact and frozen. It's a thing that we take in and we do something with it and we, and we pass it on. And um, I think that that's, something that's easily getting lost these days because people have access to so much information. But it's information that's not necessarily inflected by things. So it's one thing to, and I do this all the time, right? I'm online and I see something that's interesting to me, I see an image that's interesting to me and I right click on it and save it, right? Um, it's another thing to look at that image and remake it, do something else with it. Um, and, uh, and I think one of the things I, I want to talk about in the show is um, there's the stuff that you find that people bring to you, and then if you remake that stuff, there's a part of it that's, that's lost. There's a difference between making a collage in a time where you don't have the undo command, right? Um, so when you cut up a magazine to make something else, then that magazine is lost, right? Um, it's reconfigured. And I think that's powerful. You know, that has a really different weight to it. Um, and that's the difference, I think, you know, physically, like, if you're doing a, you know, a scene with someone where uh, you're, you know, you make some kind of intimate gesture, then, uh, you know, you can't really take that back. You can't undo that. And so it makes you think about what you're going to do very differently. And I think that's, you know, you see that all the time in online culture where people just get into these huge, um, you know, uh, 
blow up flame wars because when you're sitting there typing, everything has an equal weight. It's different than when you're looking into somebody's eyes and saying something to them. You know, if people actually had to do that, 90% of the stuff that they say online, they wouldn't say. Um, but the fact that you're like relating to a screen and typing, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think that it's our, one of the things for me that's important about when I think about queer culture, I look to, the, to those historical moments not um, as um, fetish as to say this was all good and now everything's bad, but to rather say how did this thing, what are the possibilities in telling this story again now? And how can we disrupt things now? And so the two moments that, are, that I'm looking at in the show, in, in a certain sense, are times when people were making an, a, 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 a truly different culture that wasn't about um, fitting in and saying that we're all the same. And I think that's the place that we're at right now. I see a lot of younger people who are really interested in the possibility of, you know, not just fitting into contemporary society and being accepted as one among many, but rather changing it, disrupting it, making something else happen, you know. Um, I mean, right now there's the, the Occupy show that's up, and um, I know of any number of places that have Occupy shows up right now. Um, and I think it's, I think that moment is important for people because it exists as a moment of possibility, a moment that is not necessarily automatically defined, but was about saying, this thing that we're in right now is insufficient. It's not enough. It's not, um, it's, it's not that we want a piece of it, but that the whole thing is asking the wrong questions. And I think that's where we're at right now in society. A lot of the questions that we're being asked, that that society is asking are the wrong questions. A lot of the questions that are being asked in the art world are the wrong questions. It's not just about sustaining some high-end market economy. It's about how do you make a meaningful gesture in the world? How do you connect with other people? How do you engage with them? And uh, so that's, I think, the, the real challenge in front of us. You know, I'm not so sure that this show of things that I'm rearranging is going to answer those questions, but I hope that it starts to provide a platform for us to have a different kind of conversation. Um, so, um, one of the things that I heard you say yesterday and that I've seen in the stuff I looked at, um, was really talking about the physicality mm -hmm. of things. So, and the and also kind of being in the room or being exper experienced. Mm -hmm. So, how does that work with your sculptural stuff? Mm -hmm. And yeah, how does that work? With your well, every I, I think one of the things that's been really consistent in the sculpture. Um, as, as long as I've worked, is that one way or another, it always kind of has a place where people can project themselves into it. Um, either you can sort of try it, like the, the restraint pieces that I made in the early 90s were not about... Um, they weren't just about showing you like, oh, here's a bunch of stuff that kinky people use, but they were about 
um, you looking at the sculpture and mentally trying it on yourself. Um, and so the scale of the things that I make is very much the scale of things in the real world. You know, the, the objects that you encounter every day. Um, so it's not about just kind of blowing stuff up to just make a big thing for its own sake. It's about like, what's the size of a stuffed animal? What's the size of um, a collar or a garment or, a, or, um, or you know, a plate that you eat off of? Um, it's in that way um, intimate. And I think that when you have that kind of scale, when you can mentally project yourself into the space of the piece, um, you have a different relationship to the ideas in the piece. Um, you have a much more physical uh, relationship with them. Um, then, uh, before we do some other more, less fun, more fun stuff, um, mm -hmm. you talked about come in and kind of create an exhibition and then you come back and change it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just interested in hearing you talk about why you do that and uh, what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's about asking a different kind of a question. I think that, you know, we live in a time that's, that's very odd historically. If, if you look at the entire span of, of humanity's use of art, it's only been very recently that the idea for sort of the perfect art experience is that there's this thing that you see in isolation that remains perfectly still and fixed and everybody, anyone who comes is gonna have roughly the same experience of that. If you think just of in European art, Right? If you think of an altarpiece, well, when you saw that, you didn't see it just once in your life. You saw it many times because you were coming to church. It was accompanied by words, it was accompanied by music, it was accompanied by, um, by the presence of your neighbors. So in that way, it's very similar to this mural that, that I'm talking about where these guys would come to this bar, you would see it you know, week after week as you came back. It was, you didn't have a static relationship to it. You saw it in connection with the music that was playing on the jukebox and the beer that you were having and the person that you were talking to. And that, I think, is... Um, a way of relating to objects and to art that I want to bring back and explore. And so that's why this piece, not everybody's gonna have the same experience of it. Um, there will be people who will have a different kind of sense of it. You know, you can come to the piece and sign up to um, DJ with my records. And, um, and you will have a different experience because you'll, you'll be constructing the music experience for the other people who come into the space. Um, the people who come to the events will have a really different experience because they'll see me organizing and changing the show as it goes. It's not like there's one perfect moment to experience it and all of the rest are inferior. I really like that idea of like, you had to be there. You don't automatically get the same thing as everybody else. Um, and, uh, and so the show is about trying to ask those questions and explore that and talk about the value that's there in each one of our unique experiences of the show. Um, so, if it's cool with you, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll put, leave the camera rolling, mm -hmm. 
put some stuff in front of you. Okay. Just hear what, whatever happens, happens. All right. Um, I'll probably put it in front of you, get it wide, and then I'll probably move behind you and get kind of an over the shoulder okay. to see what you're looking at. Okay. Um, and you just, whatever happens, happens. And we'll just Interesting. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 sure. So I kind of mix it up a little bit. Good. And then um, I think when you come back, you come back in a to yeah. Start yeah, yeah. I'd love to shoot you kind of doing some of the construction stuff. Sure. That's cool with you. And maybe then we could find a time to go over to Fort Yeah, and, that's great. That cool? Yeah. Um, you know, we can also go by the end up, which yeah. is the other, which is where uh, Club, is where Uranus used to be. Oh, okay. Right. So, yeah, I was actually just by there. And I mean, one of the things that's really funny is the, I was just by there yesterday, and the end up has this mural on the outside of it which is looks somewhat similar to yeah in some ways it's like this black and white mural that's kind of similar yeah so. i mean a lot of the imagery doesn't it's, it's, yeah. it's the same in, i mean the, yeah you know, the leather man with the you know it's like the same yeah, yeah. Okay. we'll probably get into that one soon cool Oh, cool. Um, I just think these are, uh -huh. especially for me, they're super fascinating. Most of them are from the 70s. Uh -huh. um, just the imagery and the... Um, yeah, yeah. Did you ever hear of Zeus Studios? Sure. This is um, leather that I stole. I used to work, the porn studio that I worked for, the guy I used to work at Zeus. Mm -hmm. so this is from the actual Zeus Studios. Uh huh. It's like a leather. Awesome. Wow, wow. Uh huh. And that, uh, I just felt like I didn't want it to just sit in a box in the basement. Like, somebody has to have this because it's, it's real living. Yeah. You know, it's not just what you get in this dress or something. You know? Well, we should, <laughs> we should put it in the show. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just pulled this out. This is like random stuff that I remember collecting in college. That, uh huh. Um, it's just images, a lot of like half naked men kind of uh -huh. images. And then some stuff we drew. And, uh, so cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, set up the camera behind you. Okay. Okay. Well, where did you go? To, where'd you go to college? Oh, okay, cool. That's where I met Uh huh. He taught a class over summer. I think it was like collection as art medium or something. Boxers from all the guys that had given to me, and I uh -huh. them up on the wall. Uh huh. That was my big collection. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think you know this. This goes back in some ways to, um, you know, one of the ways that we kind of fashion identity is through. It, you know, is through this sort of stuff, right? It's like, it's, uh, it's like, how do you, um, you know, and, and every artist's studio you go into, and it's a thing that's never talked about, and I see a lot of artist studios, because I go to, I do a lot of studio visits um, as, as a teacher. Um, you know, there's, um, Nice. I used to work at Stuffy. 
at Stop AIDS. Excellent. Um, uh, is, you know, people will have like this little altar um, set up of like, you know, some painting that they like or something else that they're thinking about that's usually like around their work table. And it's always these, you know, it's like whatever their work might be about, their sort of official work, there's this other weird little area that's sort of um, both something that they're setting up to remind themselves, but it's this other little emblem of them. And it's, it's always really exciting to me because it's the, it's the, it's often the unexpected thing. It's a little bit more tender and, you know, and so like just adding up all this stuff, like gathering all this stuff. Um, awesome. That's a great pair of glasses. Um, you know, adding up all of this stuff becomes uh, this whole other way that we explore identities, you know, that we, that, that we're, produce this kind of echo chamber for ourselves. What about, um, you know, one of the things, I mean, yeah. and it, it's interesting about this, it's like this texture is so hard to get these days. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's one of the, the yeah, the yeah. I mean, they're like the it, and it's so funny. It's like you can't, like it's one of the things that Photoshop really can't do. You know, and um, and it's one of the things that's so awesome about those about those zines from that period is that whole, you know, sense of all of this. Um, you, you know, that texture and that, that feeling to it and that immediacy. What part of, um, like I know you do, you walk around and collect stuff on the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would, I, maybe this is an overstatement, but it seems like there's kind of a, a group of, or a part of the art world that works with found objects and uh -huh. found stuff. Uh -huh. So, You know, it's, it's um, it, in some ways it's about being able to glimpse the possibility, but I, for, the, for me this most recent batch of work really started because, um, because I, I could just be really crabby, you know, mm -hmm. like I, um, I'm out walking my dog like twice a day on my block and there'll be all this just crap on the streets. And I just remember thinking like, ugh, you know, there's, really is it so hard? There's like a garbage can right over there. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? And then I realized, okay, I can sit here and complain about it, but I'm somebody, I could do something about it. You know, I can turn it into something else. And that, it, it's about answering this situation that I find myself in, not with a complaint, but with a positive gesture, you know, and, and like, and, and a transformation. And so, I love that this is, um, and you know, and it's great that this is, um, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see about that, but, um, cool. But um, I love that it's, uh, I love that it's um, uh, uh, Straight to Hell, yeah. which was yeah. a huge inspiration for me. Um, you know, yeah, and, and it was such a, again, you know, Boyd McDonald, it's like, it's such a brilliant idea. It wasn't about like, you know, oh, we'll have like a gay magazine that has like pos positive role models. It's like, let's just talk about what people actually do and want. Mm -hmm. And let's not make the language, um, you know, flowery or elevated. I mean, he was at Harvard, you know, he was not, he, he was a really, really smart guy. Yeah, he, is, he was not any, um, you know, he, he wasn't, 
you know, he he really chose to use like a very um, uh, a very down to earth um, method. Um, well, most of the audience was the you know it was like yeah the the audience was the maker you know it was the makers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, it, in, in some ways, it was like the prototypical sex scene or sex blog, you know, as well, because it was like, you know, written by the people who read it. And there's something really great about that, you know, that directness. Yeah, I just, you know. But I also, I also love that it's Rugrats. <laughs> that, is, that is super cool as well. That's kind of great. Um, and, and yeah, we should, find, we should find a place for this okay. in there. Yeah, you know? Back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things, like, one of the things that we, we're, we're asking people to do is to bring garments. Right, right. Okay. You know? Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and, and we're going to do something, we're going to do something with them. You know, but that impulse to kind of take something, you know, I mean, and um, and just hold on to it because of where, uh, you know, where it's been. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really powerful. It's a big part of us. So, huh. Club baths, oh my God. That was another thing I was going to ask you about was like San Francisco versus New York. Mm -hmm. Like you were here for a while, like probably what, like around 10, 10 years or so? Uh huh. And then you went to New York? Um, yeah, well, I grew up in New York. Like I grew up in New York and I um, went to grad school at CalArts from 82 to 84 and then came up here in 84 and was here until 96. Okay. So. It was um, really a. Um, I think I heard you say that when you came up here, you knew one person, and you didn't really know anything about San Francisco. But it seemed like a place to go. Is that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I didn't want to move back to New York. Um, I don't drive, so I couldn't really stay in LA. Right. Um, and uh, and San Francisco was the and still is the queer capital. Um, uh, and uh, you know here so here we are like in seventy five, and this is like the amazing you know such great stuff. Angels of the Liar, Gay Poetry. Yeah. Older, Elderly, Young. Holiday Bulletin is a correspondence club for older and elderly men, and also younger guys over 21 who appreciate older ones. <laughs> so like where, you know, where is the stuff from Holiday Bulletin now, right? Yeah. Kind of amazing. Leatherman's Handbook. Jack Harding. And I think, you know, one of the things that is so different now is how, um, how much more specific all of this stuff is. Like, it, you know, it, when you look online, people search for very specific things and they generate more of the same. Mm -hmm. Here you kind of have to look through all of these different options to sort of find the thing that you want and you come across like, you know, all of this, you know, all of this other stuff. Yeah. Desert Biker. It's great. San Diego, fact, not fiction. 
sexy 23, 5'4", 125, green eyes, long blonde hair. Totally honest and discreet. Also, there's something to be said for the fact that, like, it, it was expensive, you know, to, like, buy the, like, you had to really hone your, um, your writing skills. I remember placing personal ads, and it, was, it wasn't cheap. And you had to, like, you know, that's the other thing online is that there's, like, you know, it's words are, are utterly free. Um, so you totally, you, people run on at the mouth about all of this stuff where you had to, you know, Damien had to make his case in, like, <laughs> six words. You know, it's like the, the proto-tweet. <laughs> Black it? and Blue, the all-male S&M film that, you know. All action, no documentary. That's wild. <laughs> no documentary. Oh, okay. I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess the idea is that it's like, because a lot of times you'd have these films, like the Mondo films, that were like, mm -hmm. you know, all of this, like, there is a world of S&M, yeah, and yeah. blah, 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 blah. And, um, but one of the things we talked about in uh, the documentary was uh, uh, pornography in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Which was a, docu you know, it was a documentary, but it kind of broke down the walls. Mm -hmm. so like, let hardcore be shown in public. Uh huh. That's kind of wild. What was it like um, coming, going from New York to San Francisco and then back to New York after you were in San Francisco for so long? Um, you know, it was sort of, it was sort of time. I kind of felt like I'd, I'd, I'd done everything that I could do in the Bay Area, and um, I was, I was. You know, I was just ready for kind of a break. And I guess, you know, I think the, the, down, the upside of San Francisco is also kind of its downside. It's, um, the upside is that it's very accepting. And people come here to um, re, you know, um, reinvent themselves, and it's possible to do all sorts of different things here. Um, the downside is that I feel like the the communities can be very accepting, but then not really challenging for people. So it's so anything that you want to get into is fine, but then um, uh, you know. It's um, then you aren't necessarily challenged on any of that, and I think that that's tough for artists. I think it can be a place where it's like, okay, everything's sort of acceptable, but then where are you pushed to make the next thing? And I, I felt like I really needed that. I hear that a lot actually because people in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. that, uh, it's almost too too open or too there's, there's not a lot of challenge. To well, like push yourself or creative things are seen as good unto themselves without too much critical thought. Yeah, it's like everything's fine, but then nothing matters so much. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, that sort of shifts, but it is a, um, it is part of it, you know. And was that different in New York? Like, is that, did you find when you went back that? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely um, the expectation is kind of like, okay, that's what you did last time, what are you going to do next? And that's, and, and uh, you know, for me, getting out of school as an artist, I knew that that was going to be too much pressure and too much attention early on, and that I needed some time 
to sort of figure out what my work was going to be about and, and to understand it differently. And that's why San Francisco was really, really valuable at that point. Um, but it was, it, it was also nice to kind of get back to that sort of, to that sort of push. Mm. Yeah. Can you still do that? Um, yes and no. I mean, it's an, you know, it's kind of an interesting time and we're, and I think that one of the things, and maybe this relates to the show in some, to some extent, but I think one of the things that we're all facing right now is this um, sort of cycle of um, gentrification and development where artists are, are sort of put in the position of being these kind of bohemians that are really just there to, not to provide some sort of an alternative way of organizing society, but to really just speed along the cycle of like taking neighborhoods and displacing people and putting somebody else in and then moving them out and raising the value of real estate. That there that they're really are, you know, being confronted internationally. I mean, this isn't, this isn't just located in New York and San Francisco, but um, you know, they, they are literally the window dressing on neighborhoods. Um, and uh, it's very difficult for people. And I, I think that, um, uh, you know, Rebecca Solnit has, has written really eloquently about this and, and, uh, and Sarah Schulman um, have both written really interesting books that are about this sort of dilemma of like, you know, trying to live a creative, engaged life in the midst of a system that is really just about trying to monetize all of that as, as rapidly as possible. So. I definitely feel that tension in my own existence, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, this is kind of an amazing, this is an amazing ad. Um, transsexuals, attractive masculine uh, white man, I assume that that is, age 30, 6'2", 190, seeks permanent relationship with a transsexual or liberal girl. Relationship must, uh, must be over 5'5", five five and be financially and emotionally stable. Um, prefer someone who is feminine and slender. Call Chuck Rogers in Hollywood <laughs> with his phone number. We can call Chuck and find out if I found out if things worked out. That's kind of amazing. But I but I love like you know what's the story behind that? Must be over five five and financially and emotionally stable. So who was like the short you know liberal girl that Chuck got involved with before <laughs> and <laughs> who was you know, who wasn't who just wasn't emotionally stable enough you know That's so amazing um, what about the I know some of the earlier or, I don't know I just kind of studied your stuff over the last couple mm -hmm. years so the timeline maybe is uh -huh. a little off in my head but some of the stuff that I saw with the dresses early on was there was some gender stuff. Uh-huh. That was, was that earlier? Or was that, or was it just continuous? Uh, you mean of me uh, in? Yeah, something about you wearing dresses. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for a while I was doing these uh, performances, like in the early 90s, and the, I was using like prom, I would go to the thrift store and get like yeah, prom, dresses prom dresses, like and um, it was uh, in part to sort of have a costume, you know, in some way. And I've always really, um, I, I've always really liked um, uh, genderfuck drag. So, um, you know, people like Jack Smith and the Cockettes and the Sisters and where it's, it hasn't been about, um, passing, you know, um, but has been about kind of disrupting your expectations 
of of um, of gender, and um, and so I, I you know I like um, mixed signals. I like it to be kind of unsettled. So um, you know there's there's I'm I'm doing some more of that stuff now. Um, and it's one of the things where I'm sort of curious to see where it goes. You know, there's gonna, there'll be some dressing up in this show. We'll see what that's about. The, uh, I watched the Alexander McQueen video. Yeah. yeah about deconstruction yeah. of the... It, it, yeah, sort of like the deconstruction of the bride. He starts yeah. out with a model in a men's suit and then cuts it and reworks it. And I think it's such an eloquent... I mean, I, I thought that that was an amazing, his exhibition uh, at the Met was really amazing. Um, for the first time in a long time, I really saw, you know, here's somebody who was really thinking about the power of clothes and the power of, um, uh, you know, all of the various ways of working with them and the different kind of signals of them. And I love that video because it's so, um, it's like watching the film of Jackson Pollock make the action painting. You know, it's like this, the deliberateness with which he moves and the inventiveness with which he's transforming that clothing is really, um, uh, I really respond to that as a sculptor. And it's a male, it's a male model, is it? I think it's a female model, but I don't, I don't remember. I'm, I'm, now I'm not remembering, but, um, but yeah. I, you know, I think that there's, uh, I, th I think there's some great stuff in that, and um, Walter von Bierendorf is some another designer who I think is a really, um, really, really interesting fashion guy, and, and I've always really loved um, uh, Ray Kuwabata from Come to Garçon, and so there's, you know, that stuff is is also really appealing to me, and I, you know, I, I'm I have a hard time. I I I like uniforms, but I don't uh, I don't like them as a lifestyle. You know, there's something hot about them, but there's also you know I I don't I'm not a person who uh, I'm too sloppy to to be um, invested in the precision of a of of you know, a uniform all the time. I like it to, I like it when things get fucked up, so. There's also something about, um, you know, like the old, the old Hanky code. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of being, being able to identify other people through that kind of visual, mm -hmm. you know, when, when it wasn't really spoken about. Really yeah. Well, also when you could be arrested and, yeah. and, and, you know, um, given shock therapy yeah. for it, you know. Yeah. It's interesting, gay sunshine was always a little <laughs> difficult for me. Yeah, I mean, at the yes, at the time. Although when it was really like super hippie-ish, that I really liked. But the sort of when it would sort of have this sort of high class attitude towards it would be a little it was a little tough for me. And um, Kathy Ecker was a big influence for you. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like yeah. Uh huh. Blood and guts in high school, and yeah, um, yeah. I mean, if you um, there's some collection that collects the first, like the first three books. Um, I think it's um, Childlike Life of the Black Tarantula. Um, uh, uh, something Life of Toulouse Lautrec and maybe Great Expectations, those three, I think, are together in one volume. And those are really amazing. I, you know, I, I, 
was lucky enough to have a teacher who told me about her in college. Um, and I became like a total fan and... and Did she do cut-up stuff? Like the, basically, um, her work was sort of her rewriting things that she had read. And some of it was quite directly um, uh, collaged, but that was really the early things. Most of it was her kind of reading things and re-inhabiting them and transforming them and, and, and putting them back out. So. Um, well, we can keep going. I'm happy to spend as much time as you want. But I'm, I'm, I'm a little... Yeah, yeah. Totally <laughs> I, feel, I feel a little done. Cool. He's cute, though. Talk about talk about your hippies. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> when you uh, get to make your when you're in the space and doing your stuff, it probably feels a lot less heavy than having to talk about it all the time. Uh, no. Well, it's I, I mean I do end up I do end up talking a lot, and that's fine. Um, I tend to, like, like once I get started working, it's, I get involved in the sort of decision-making process where I'd, I do get kind of silent because I'm sort of weighing all these different possibilities and so. Will it be fun to watch your work? Yeah, I think it'll be great. And definitely, like, bring these back and we'll find a, we'll find a place for them. Oop. I forget I had that on. <laughs> so I'm going to run to the bathroom, but cool. when I come back, tell me some more about this stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah.